Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, latest in this uh, round of uh, webinar series uh, that we've been bringing to you over the uh, of the course of the last uh, months and years. Um, this one in, is on a particularly interesting topic, uh, the future of buses. Buses has been something of a, um, a bit of a sideshow and maybe a bit of a backwater in a lot of transport planning uh, in recent times in the UK, um, but certainly in the last couple of years, as we've tried to uh, recover from the pandemic, it's, uh, it's, it's starting to become front and centre stage. My name is Neil Birch. I'm uh, a project director at Sistra, and my particular uh, responsibility is uh, de uh, um, delivering transport, uh, public transport related projects, in particular those related to buses um, across the, the UK and Ireland. And uh, I've been doing that for uh, the best part of 30 years, half, half of that time with a couple of the UK's largest bus operators. So if we rewind back to, to, to 2021, the government launched uh, Bus Back Better uh, in England uh, and the, uh, the Bus Service Improvement Plan initiative. Um, and uh, as part of the COVID recovery, it's been pumping money into uh, both uh, the Bus Service Improvement Plans, now BSIP Plus, uh, Bus Service Operator Grant Plus, and a whole host of funding uh, to support the industry uh, through the COVID pandemic and as it tries to recover. The latest of those in England being the, 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 the £2 fare cap, uh, and uh, which will uh, become the, the £2.50 fair cap from the autumn. As part of this uh, webinar, we want to um, help you all to gain a better understanding of the future for public transport, uh, and in particular buses across the UK. Uh, we're going to uh, hear about some uh, interesting innovation, and we're going to hear from people who are working in a whole range of uh, different initiatives, including, uh, I know a number of you are interested in uh, the role of uh, bus franchising uh, and the role of enhanced partnerships in, uh, in de delivering better bus services for local communities and councils. Um, we're going to have a look at some of those best um, best practice, best service provision and the challenges that are that are being faced. Uh, and in particular, uh, look at some of the impacts that that is having on uh, some of the more vulnerable members of uh, people in our communities. So without further ado, I'm going to move on to uh, the first of our uh, three speakers uh, this morning. Um, Matt Goggins is Assistant Director for BUS at uh, the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. As part of that role, Matt leads a range of, of high profile programmes and projects within the city region, focused on improving the bus offer uh, as part of creating a, an integrated transport system for uh, the Liverpool city region. He's been working on bus reform. He's also been involved in the deployment of uh, hydrogen powered zero emission buses and are delivering over £100 million worth of investment in bus priority. So I think we're going to hear some really interesting uh, and groundbreaking things from, from Matt. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to, to, to Matt and he can take us through uh, his contribution to this debate. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Neil. Um, good morning um, to everybody uh, on the call. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, speak with you this morning uh, on the subject of uh, uh, the future of buses in the Liverpool City region and in particular uh, what it is that, that we're doing in, in this space. I thought it'd be useful just to start off with a, a very quick overview of who we are as, uh, as a combined authority. So if we could have the first slide please. Combined Authority is a, a politically led organisation, as many of you will know, with an elected uh, mayor, Steve Rotherham, uh, brings together the six local authority areas that you see there on the screen, uh, Halton, Knowsley, Liverpool, Sefton, St Helens and Wirral. We cover a population of around 1.6 million people, but actually our catchment area is much wider than that, around 3 million people. And we believe that decisions that affect those 1.6 million people or that affect those 3 million people are better and more effective when they're made uh, locally. So our outlook and our ambition as a combined authority is very much grounded in policy and funding decisions being made in the region uh, rather than in Whitehall. And on that basis we have a number of devolved uh, powers and funding, funding streams related to things uh, like transport, the economy, employment, culture, 
digital and housing. And of course, for transport and for buses, those uh, devolved powers include the ability to franchise the bus network. If we go to the next slide, please. We're really clear in our vision for the region that we want to create a, a fairer, stronger, cleaner city region where no one's left behind. And for transport, this creates, I think, two significant challenges, but also uh, opportunities. The first is the creation of a, a comprehensive, integrated, affordable public transport system. And the second is climate change and the delivery of, of net zero. So when we're considering the question of the future of the bus industry in our region, it's framed by those challenges uh, and the significant role that buses need to play in helping to address them. We're focused today on, uh, on bus, but before I go on to talk about that in a little bit more detail, it's probably worth briefly mentioning what we're doing more widely on transport in the region. And I think this is important for, for two reasons. Firstly, in bringing together an integrated transport system, we need to focus on all of the various parts of, of that system. And secondly, local authorities, uh, I think maybe sometimes with some justification, get criticism that we we don't have vision, that we might talk a good game, but we're not very good at actually doing things. But we feel that that's not the case in our region. If we have the next slide, please. So what are we doing? Well, we're, we're in the middle of a, a half a billion pound uh, investment in our local rail network, including new trains, which we, we own rather than being leased from a rolling stock company. Uh, these trains have step-free access at every door, carry twice as many people as the uh, as the previous trains do, include line extensions, new stations, and introduce pioneering battery technology, which will allow trains to run on our network beyond the uh, beyond the third rail. Mersey Rail is uh, the network on which those trains will operate is devolved, so the combined authority effectively takes the role of the Department for Transport for, 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 the, for that network and it's already one of the most successful urban rail networks even before the investment that I talked about um, kicks in with very high levels of punctuality, reliability, satisfaction and no plans to close any of the ticket offices on that network either. We own and operate two toll roads, two of the longest tunnels, road tunnels in anywhere in the UK under the River Mersey we're the custodians uh, and operators of the Mersey Ferry, which first began operating between Liverpool and Wirral in 1317. And we're developing a 600 kilometer cycling and walking network. And our modern day challenge really is to bring all of those things together in one integrated uh, system. And from our perspective, that's uh, a really exciting challenge. Focusing in uh, now on bus, I've, I've already mentioned uh, where we are uh, to, to, and to set the scene a little bit more I'm just going to spend uh, a few minutes talking about the why, the when and the what. So if we could have the next slide please. So firstly the, the, the why, so the Liverpool City region has lots of great strengths but being honest it's under delivering on its potential. Our GVA is lower than most other city regions uh, in the UK and we're, we're, not, uh, we're, we're not competing as well as we could. Our transport network is good, it's delivering for some people, for many people in fact, but not for everybody. And our role is to use some of the unique strengths that we have in our region to unlock the potential that we undoubtedly have. It's important because it's what our residents deserve. Many have been uh, neglected or in uh, cycles of worklessness, poverty, deprivation, serious deprivation and ill health and we owe it to them to help them break uh, that cycle. We have the paradox really of a, of a car culture but also low levels of car ownership and again for us it's about breaking that uh, car culture with better transport helping that, supporting access to opportunity but also providing a real option for people so that as our economy improves, which it undoubtedly will, the first decision that, that people make then isn't to go and buy a car. And we want economic growth coupled with low car ownership to be a badge of honour for our region rather than a cause for concern. 
As a coastal uh, region, climate change and sea level rise is uh, an existential threat. So put simply, uh, if everyone carries on doing, uh, doing what they're doing now, then many of our communities will be underwater or there'll be a serious risk of catastrophic flooding events over the next 50 years. Uh, many of our carbon emissions are from transport. So from a bus perspective, we, we clearly need to remove diesel from, from our bus system, but we also need to double the amount of people using that bus system to get them out of their cars if we're going to play the part that we need to play to deliver net zero carbon. Secondly, the when. So the simple answer is, is now, uh, this year, and there's a very practical demonstration uh, of that. When we, when we look at decarbonisation, for example, our target is, uh, is to have a net zero carbon economy by 2038. So a new bus purchased in our region next year will be operating on the streets of our region after the net zero target is supposed to have been met. So whilst it's great to see uh, investment from our operators in new buses, as we do, and a new bus, a new diesel bus is, is clearly better than uh, an old diesel bus, we can't afford to keep bringing new diesel buses into, uh, into our bus system and we need a proper plan for, for phasing them out. That means that we need to uh, begin some significant investment with the private sector in zero emission bus technology and rollout. We have a, a 1,200 strong bus fleet in our region, but by the end of this year, only 32 of those will be zero uh, emission. And we need to replace that fleet at the rate of around 100 zero, zero emission buses a year, every year until that 2038 date comes round. So whilst, whilst 2038 feels far away, it absolutely is, and, and it's immediate challenge for us to step up to, uh, to now. And thirdly, the, the what. So, it's not one thing that will be a silver bullet for our bus system. Our BSIP sets out five areas for uh, for improvement, and each of those is important, and each of our actions will be aimed at addressing those. The number one thing that people uh, tell us puts them off using the bus system isn't because it's regulated or deregulated. It's that they're too slow and they're too unreliable, and we have to fix that. It's one area where... In Liverpool City region, our track, rec track record hasn't always been uh, great, but we are working on, on plans, as Neil said in the introduction, to deliver over £100 million of bus priority measures across our region to, to, to tackle it. People tell us also that in, in some, but not all, cases, the network isn't as comprehensive as it needs to be to allow them to rely on buses as a, as a real choice for them. They say it can be confusing and expensive. And we have made some progress on uh, on addressing cost in particular, but we have, if I'm honest, some real challenges as a result of uh, BSIP allocations not matching the level of ambition that we clearly have on this, and also the widening gap between cost and revenue in the bus system without that subsidy is a real cause for concern. And I think the, the BSIP process has been one of the biggest disappointments, I think, for us over the, the last couple of years. And I really do think about the difference that we could make if that ambition that we were asked to show was, was matched, by, uh, matched by the funding. A significant choice that our mayor, our Metro mayor and the leaders of our local authorities will need to take over the next year is around the operating model of our bus system, whether we're going to franchise the, uh, the, the bus network. We've undertaken an assessment of, uh, of options which suggests that we should. Uh, the mayor and the leaders have said it's their preferred option and we're currently in the process of consulting with the public and with the industry and key stakeholders on proposals to do that. Uh, many of you will know that that will put the responsibility of addressing those strategic challenges in the hands of the public sector with someone that people can hold to account. But with that clearly comes a set, a new set of, uh, of challenges and for a public authority in a franchise world there is no hiding place from those challenges. But if we're going to stand a chance of, uh, of doing that properly, it's really clear we're going to have to involve, re it's going to have to involve real collaboration and partnership between uh, the private and public sector, whether that's bus operators on delivering services with power and fuel suppliers on electric or, or hydrogen or financial institutions on uh, the finance to deliver that step change in, in technology at, at, at pace and scale. 
some people will be aware of the hydrogen bus project where we're, we're introducing uh, hydrogen powered buses onto our network this year. We don't know if hydrogen is the future. We like the theory and this project is going to help us to test that theory in the real world, the technology, the total cost of ownership, whether manufacturers and suppliers and providers can deliver the public sector ownership of, of assets and a, a real step change as you'll see from the picture there on the left in, in the passenger experience. I think to, to sum up, um, we, we have strong political recognition of the role that buses can and need to play in our region if we're going to hit our strategic uh, goals around the economy, around transport, around climate change. We, we've won that argument um, and there's no getting away, as Neil said, from the political focus that there now is on bus that, that wasn't always the case. I think we're on an exciting journey as many other city regions uh, will be and I feel the ones that will do this well will be the ones that create the best conditions for buses to thrive, that understand well the, the finances of the system, put passengers at the heart of decision making and create true partnerships to make that happen. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Matt. Lots of interesting uh, food for thought already in that. Um, we'll crack on because uh, I want to have plenty of time to uh, to get to your questions. Please keep uh, posing your questions in the in the Q and A section. Uh, already some interesting ones coming in to supplement the ones that were sent before. Uh, so, without further ado, we'll move on to Andy. Andy Gibbons has worked in buses since uh, deregulation in October 1986. Started at uh, TFL, uh, spent five years at uh, Nottingham County Council, where he and uh, and has then been uh, head of public transport at uh, Nottingham City Council for 20 years before moving on to become program manager for bus transformation at Leicester City Council where he's been for the last four years. So we'll uh, hear from you now, Andy. Thank you. Hi, folks. Right, I've got quite a few slides here, so you don't have to look at me too much. Um, so um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So what I'm going to do is just go through the context of Leicester, because I think you, in order to look at these things, you do need to know the local art by uh, way that things have been built up and possibly learn from how the process that we've gone through, go through the, the BSIP process that led to the development of our enhanced partnership scheme, some of the delivery issues we've had in the first year of that, some of the things that are coming through uh, we're delivering next year. And then what I try and do is focus for this session more at the last few slides, which look at the sort of conclusions that we've come to within the enhanced partnership model some suggestions for the industry, particularly for DFT, perhaps on how to improve things going forward. So next, next slide, please. Right. Um, as any economists know, buses are we're using buses as a derived demand. No one, unless you're a bit of a anorak, wants to travel on a bus unless they need to. Um, so there's a lot of external factors that drive whether buses are good, not just whether the, the buses themselves, but a significant number of, of areas. And in I've sort of mapped these out here and in, in Leicester's point of um, the way that uh, things are set up in Leicester, um, it's got a very dense urban pop growing population, which is obviously a tick point, um, particularly as we've got reasonably low car ownership. Uh, but unfortunately, like most cities, higher, high rising car ownership on the periphery in the wealthier areas. Um, we've got, unlike Nottingham down the road, uh, plentiful cheap uh, private car parking, uh, twice the number of parking spaces in city centre as Nottingham. Um, we've also got, which makes it quite difficult for buses, a significant amount of employment outside the city centre. Um, and uh, housing growth again on the edge of the urban area which makes it harder to serve by public transport. On the plus side, um, uh, we've got a very vibrant city centre with universities and colleges in the city centre and also a hospital, the, main, the main hospital in the city centre as well, although we have also two on the edges. And a lot of regeneration um, and tourism and sport based in the city centre itself, that's the cracking sort of plus point for that. Uh, for buses. Um, we're a unitary, which does make it very easy, much easier than anywhere else to deliver things, very clear, all right, 
uh, but we're reasonably underbounded, so our boundary doesn't doesn't cover the city council's boundary doesn't cover um, all of the urban area, and then there's a complication of a two tier system outside of our area, and uh, politically, uh, you know, we've got a single mayor, which very very engaged, um, very good, um, but we're not a combined metro. Uh, combined authority with the Metro Mayor, so we lose out on particularly funding on that. Next question, next slide, please. Um, when we reviewed our network in 2020, um, as part of the BSIP process, um, we're quite unusual, I think, in that we've got a significant commercial network, good commercial network with trip levels you know, well above average, um, reasonably high modal share, uh, good frequencies on the core bus routes. And I say what is unusual is there's not one dominant local bus operator, which is, it is most cities have got one lo local office. We've got three with reasonably good uh, market share. Um, we've got um, three three park and rides, not, not all the way around the city, but mainly focused on the, uh, the motorway network. Um, we, the network is centered in the city center to, to the city centre, hardly any cross city bus services, which make it difficult to directly serve growing employment on the outside. Uh, there's the review showed, like most cities, poor inner and outer orbital linkages and um, empty buses in the morning going outbound. So, a very low interchange out to the growth um, areas and employment sites outside the city centre. Um, from a busing point of view, limited suburban rail network um, which which has sort of led to the growth of the um, you know of the, of the bus network over the years uh, significant congestion on the various as three essentially three ring roads um, around the city and, and at the interchange between the radials um, and the orbital orbitals that is where significant congestion is which does make mean that um, a lot of the bus lanes along the radials, um, we can only do a limited amount of bus priority work because they still get stuck at the interchange, which is most of the interchanges with the orbitals are at grade. Um, and then the other thing we looked at was um, looking at flows. There wasn't any one significant two-way flow on any key corridor, which sort of did, did point to the fact that um, there was really uh, very difficult to get a business case together for any key BRT or LRT project. Right, next slide, please. Okay, so our plan, won't go through this huge detail, but our plan uh, covers the whole area, obviously looking at accessibility, congestion, environment and sustainable growth, the same as everybody else issues, some everybody else has got. Um, we focus, because we, we had um, transport needs across the whole of the conurbation and no you know no, no large flows on any particular area the focus we concluded should be package based and bus based um, looking at the core radial network into the city center that's the major commercial network and also to look at uh, improving the orbital and park and ride network which is feeding wider and wider movements and interchange a lot of partners involved came up with um, five main aims, which are plastered at every bus shelter now and bus stop all over the city, um, focusing on greening the fleet, uh, making things reliable and frequent, making it a lot easier for people to use and better value. Um, they're the outputs we, we put into our plan and our BSIP. And we had a, we didn't get massively, we didn't promise the earth, but we did look at uh, getting a third a 13% increase, 40% post-COVID, but a 13% increase over eight years um, through the approach that we set forward, trying to over eight years to get the whole fleet to electric and the transport focus satisfaction rates up to 90%. And we costed it out as for 400 million intervention money required over eight years. So next, next slide, please. That's our launch. Next one, please. So what we came up with um, was uh, we had the plan that all got approved. Uh, that was the BSIP. Um, but 
we didn't get any VSIP money at all, nothing, even though the plan was voted by many of the bus operators being the best they'd seen. Uh, for some reason, DFT decided not to give us any money at all. Um, that said, we, we had already got Transforming Cities Fund money and um, that we focused largely on bus. Um, we were successful also in getting Zebra, um, Zebra money as well and get better get, getting building money. So we did get together a, a scheme of deliverables, uh, which is on the screen worth nearly a hundred million pounds. And we netted that into a legal partnership scheme to deliver a whole lot of things, which is basically a hundred deliverables over three years. So next slide, please. So that's what we've been doing. So over the first year, we've done 75 of those. So we've done um, uh, our green lines, which are mainly our contracted partnership routes. So we've got 24 buses that we've purchased, electric buses, all different sorts, uh, running on six routes from two charging depots at two smaller operators uh, with a complete package approach. Next slide, please. And that included the free city centre one, which anyone who wants to come to Leicester, they can have a go round on and that after three months, it's got up to a thousand trips a day. Next slide. And that's just a slide showing the, uh, the, the contracted uh, network of um, services that we keyed, we, we picked out as being um, uh, ones that we would develop up through the plan. So next one, please. But more significantly, we've had significant investment by the operators on the commercial routes. Uh, so first bus have uh, converted their whole of their depot to electric and all 68 of their saloons uh, are now in the process of being converted to the buses that you see there on the screen. And then the, their deckers are going to a similar to electric in by spring next year. Bereva putting in 24 deca, decas on two main routes by the end, actually by the end of this, this year now, by, by November this year, uh, and Stagecoach um, on their main route into the city uh, by the summer next year. So by the end of, by the summer next year, we'll have half the main PVR on the main routes, um, uh, totally electric, uh, all looking the same, all looking green. All with Leicester buses branding. Next slide, please. So what we're doing on frequency, um, we've had limited limited um, reductions uh, post COVID, uh, partly because we had a network coordination plan where with a series of quali qualifying agreements, we've removed all duplication across operators on the nine shared corridors. Three are coordinated now, six have gone to a single operator to reduce PVR. Uh, making things more efficient, much better use of simplification. We've increased our tender service network significantly um, and got the revenue, revenue cost of that down through electric bus ownership. And then we partnered up with the health service and, and one or two other um, partners to, to fund the, uh, the developing contracted network. So that's what we're doing on frequency. Next slide, please. Just a couple more minutes, uh, Andy, if you could. I'll rattle through these. So reliability, you won't know these areas, but we've got a huge number of bus lanes we've delivered um, over the next, over the last year, uh, to all fully enforced, and also digital ticketing, which I'll come on to in a minute. So next slide, please. In terms of making things easier, we've got brand new bus station, real-time displays at now all boarding stops, uh, learning new bus shelters, We've got tap in, tap out ticketing um, with uh, single and multi operator weekly and daily fare capping. Uh, we've got set registration dates, uh, clear website, and so we've done the network coordination and we've got coordinated printed timetables now going on stream. So we've made things easier for people. And also, next slide, we've done things to try to make things much better value. So all scholars now get an annual flexi ticket rather than just a ticket on a given service for school days only. Uh, unemployed got uh, discounts. We've got a whole new range of flexi multi-operator tickets, and we've got the premium down to around about 10%. Uh, Toto we've got in place, I think, the first, uh, first area to do or operator capping on that. And we've got discounts on park and ride for health workers. 
So next slide, please. So delivery issues, these are things you might be interested in a bit more. Um, uh, we've delivered all the ones that are purely only bus schemes are much easier to deliver than the bus priority schemes, which most of our bus priority schemes have been very complicated because they're parts of bigger schemes. They include walking, cycling and, and other aspects of those. So they are hard, much harder to deliver than say putting in real time things. We had to shell four of our schemes and replace those with other schemes. Uh, park and ride, the um, yeah, the case has dropped since uh, since COVID. Bus lane section, a couple of bus lanes and busway sections, we couldn't get a business case, full business case through County Council when it came to the actual FBC, full business case wouldn't support it and there were environmental issues on that. So next day, next, just the next slide. So say so we've, we've, we've delivered 75 of 100. Uh, so we're on track to deliver the rest next year well ahead of schedule. But we're now coming to a massive cliff face because we've got no funding to do anything more. All right, we've got um, operating miles down, accessibility levels maintained, frequency levels maintained, punctuality up, uh, flexi trips doubled, uh, increase in numbers on hospital hopper as an example. So we've got quite a lot of good monitoring statistics coming through showing we're moving in the right direction. Next slide, please. Uh, we've got a load more buses coming next year, um, some more bus lanes, some bus lane enforcement work, and some traffic light priority work as well, more, more real-time totems, that's what's coming next year. And then the next couple of slides are really focusing on uh, what I think are the lessons learned from our journeys to date. Um, we are still pro-partnership uh, working. Um, very pro partnership working. We, we've got a good base on which we've worked, uh, we could work from. We've, I think, got momentum going in the right direction. We're delivering, we've got, all right. Um, we are still subject to external factors like most people are. So those, you know, that there does need to be um, a lot of consideration given to external factors within the industry as well. We need to keep the focus going, don't get deflected. That's difficult, that is difficult keep the focus going, particularly when we've got no more money now, so we're not building up any, any new schemes. Um, we, in order to keep everything going and not to deflect, you have to look at the whole area, the whole area of the bus business, not just one or two corridors. Um, we found that keeping things local um, and swiftly changing things and being flexible uh, keeps everybody on the ball and keeps everyone moving in the, in the right direction. Um, as I say, we've still got a long way to go on our plan, if you see. We do need far more money um, from both revenue and capital uh, to keep things going. Um, and we do need ways to keep the momentum and everybody engaged in the partnership. We've got, we've got a lot of players involved. Keeping them all engaged is now difficult. So the next stage, next slide, really, which is saying some of the suggestions. Can just wrap up, Andy, please. Yeah. So this is really the last one. Um, uh, I I think there needs to be a different approach of funding split between city and shires. I think uh, capital and revenue funding should be focused on investment, delivery, and patronage, not on population and other factors that the DFD seem to be doing. Um, I do think that. Um, uh, they're not, there needs to be quite a lot of um, changes uh, at um, bus operator level, perhaps, to, to localise things more. There needs to be changes in... Um, we need to introduce some legal standards for accessibility, perhaps bring in um, a requirement for a high-level bus manager, every LTA, like there is the traffic manager, uh, and also locally a bus are. And I think... Again, everything needs to be kept local through de devolution, de easier devolution of registration, BSOP money, easier ability to do user charging. Um, we, we've tried that and failed because of the obstacles involved. Um, and you, you should be able to deliver quite a lot of things without having to become combined authority. Next slides, please. That's really about it. There's a whole lot of links on there, which on this slide pack, which you'll get, which you can look at, um, you know, to get a bit more granularity to what you said. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Andy. Um, interesting to contrast the uh, the approach to partnership with the uh, the moves towards franchising there that Matt was telling us about. But we'll, we'll move straight on to, to Graham. Graham Vidler is the Chief Executive of the uh, Confederation of Passenger Transport, uh, the UK trade body, um, and he's also an advisory uh, board member on the DFT's uh, Bus Centre of Excellence. So, uh, Graham, we'll hear from you and then we'll move on to some questions. Thank you very much, Neil. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, as Neil said, I'm both Chief Executive of CPT uh, and like Matt, who spoke before me, actually proud to be an advisory board member of the newly founded Bus Centre of Excellence. Uh, my view today will be in my capacity as Chief Executive of CPT. Um, look, I think it's clear that everyone has got a stake in buses succeeding. Uh, and buses growing into the future, whether you're interested in the environment, the economy, the connectivity of communities, local air quality or liv livability, you want buses to make more of a contribution to your local area. And I want to talk today about the, the five key ways that that can be made a reality. Next slide, please. Um, Coming after Matt and Andy, I'm obviously going to be repeating some of the things that they've said because you know there, there is a bit of a playbook emerging for transforming local bus services and Leicester and Liverpool are very much at the forefront of that. So you'll hear me cover some things uh, that they've both covered. You'll also, I think, hear me say some new things as well. Uh, next slide, please. Fundamentally, uh, I think we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we need to deliver a great experience every time a passenger chooses to, to use one of our buses. Uh, and I think the transport focus research into passenger satisfaction shows that we, we deliver a consistently good outcome, uh, as you can see here, above 80% satisfaction with uh, last bus journey. This is from the survey they've run for the last couple of years. There were, there were similar results in the bus passenger survey that they used to run before the pandemic. Um, and, and, and this is absolutely fundamental, whether, whether we're talking about information before you get on the bus, the reliability of the service, the greeting you get from the driver, the facilities on board, cleanliness, whatever it may be, we need to deliver a brilliant outcome every time. Uh, I'd like to see more very satisfied in this picture. At the moment, it's split roughly half and half between very satisfied and fairly satisfied. I, I think we need to move that blue bar up. I think there's also a need to address some key gaps in satisfaction which sit behind that headline satisfaction. Next slide, please. Uh, the first of those, I think, is the availability and frequency of services. Uh, and, and even people who are using the bus are consistently disappointed with uh, frequency levels uh, and the availability of services in areas near them. Uh, and, and this graph summarizes very simply at a national level why that is. We've lost about 25% of mileage uh, in England outside of London over the last decade or so. Uh, that loss has happened pretty much everywhere, every type of area. And it's important to know that it's happened in two phases. Uh, firstly, the 2010s saw a decline in supported services. Secondly, the pandemic saw a very sharp decline, which is been partially recovered um, subsequently in commercial services uh, and the net result of those two things is that 25% reduction. Uh, I'm not saying that we need to put all of that 25% back on, far from it, but I do think we need to offer people more buses to choose from and, and, and I think that will take, I think there's an urban and a rural small town context to that. In, in urban areas, I think it's really, really important that we have uh, what I might call frequent flagship services that people know they will see every five to 10 minutes on key corridors. It, it means you can rely on that bus service. It also means, I think, it also says, I think, something more about the presence of buses in that, in that local market more generally. And I think it's really important that we continue to invest 
in frequencies on those key corridors. But also, I think we need to be cognizant of the issues in many rural areas and smaller towns where, where bus services in some cases have all but disappeared. Um, DFT promised in the National Bus Strategy to uh, develop a measure of socially and economically necessary services, which two years later still hasn't moved on. Uh, we think it urgently does need to move on. Uh, and at CPT, working with partners in a number of local authority organisations, we'll be conducting some research later this year to try and guide that, that guidance and to identify some, some rules for how you might deliver more and better bus services in some of those more remote locations. Next slide, please. Uh, next thing we need, and, and both uh, Andy and Matt have already talked about this, is, is faster buses. Uh, the slide here shows the decline in bus speeds over the last eight or nine years. Uh, this decline, although it's quite small, follows decades of previous decline. And even the decline shown here, about three and a half percent, ties up around 600 vehicles and adds over 130 million pounds to the industry's cost base. So what we're getting what we're getting from that is both a worse service for passengers because their, their bus is taking longer to get where they need to go and a greater cost for industry, a, a, a vicious downward spiral that I, I know you're all familiar with and which we urgently need to break out of by investing in bus priority. Next slide, please. Uh, the fourth thing I want to talk about is the need for greater clarity in the price of bus travel. Uh, so the, the chart here summarises some research that was done in the West Midlands late last year on, on what people thought bus travel cost. Uh, and as you can see, consumers estimated on average that it would cost significantly more than it actually does. So, so for a single ticket, they estimated it would cost a third more than the actual price. Uh, and, and this obviously is in a, in a market, the West Midlands, which is one of the uh, simplest um, areas in the country in terms of pricing. I think we need to do a much better job in explaining to customers how much they can expect to pay for their bus travel to give them the confidence to, to choose bus more often. It's not necessarily about making uh, prices aligned to a, a single flat fare, uh, as is the, the current policy. I think it's more about the sort of measure which Andy touched on that, that Leicester are leading the way in. Uh, contactless, price cap ticketing, where you know whichever operator you're going to use, the maximum you'll pay for any one day or any one week's travel. I think that will really help. Next slide, please. Um, and as I said, you, you've probably heard most of uh, what I've talked about already covered in Matt and Andy's presentations, and you'll you'll see it in most uh, BSIPs if you take the time to to look through them, because the the four elements I've talked about already are fundamental elements of how we need to transform bus uh, services. My, my fifth key is one that you won't see so often, and that's because it's not directly uh, about bus services. Um, I think we need to recognise that however much we improve bus services, improve the infrastructure on which they operate, market them to passengers and potential passengers, people really, really like their car. Uh, and people, let, let's be honest, if you're going to use the bus and you're, you're a car owner, you have to walk past your car, which is probably parked outside your door, in order to get to the bus stop. So I think what we need is policies within it, each local area which complement bus policies uh, and which make driving meet a, a fairer share of the costs it imposes on everybody else, uh, whether that's uh, action on parking charges, whether it's action on parking in the workplace, whether it's congestion charging, I think there is a real challenge for us to complement all of the great stuff we're doing on transforming buses 
with some action on making car travel a little bit less attractive for some journeys some of the time. Uh, and I think the, the, the great thing about all of these five keys is they can be delivered in a variety of different regulatory settings. Uh, and, and I think as both Andy and Matt have shown and said, franchising uh, enhanced partnership is really a second order issue compared to making the investment, and that's an investment of money and an investment uh, of political will in making some of the changes that I've, I've set out here today. So thank you all very much for listening. Uh, look forward to hearing and hopefully answering some of your questions. Thank you very much, Graham, and thank you very much to Matt and Andy uh, once again. So we've got ourselves about 45 minutes to uh, deal with the uh, with the, the large number of questions that have been have been pouring in. Um, I'm going to start with uh, one that was described as being um, the the elephant in the room, uh, and that is about funding. I think we probably all recognise we could do um, a lot of wonderful things with buses if we had more money to uh, to spend on it um but i guess the question is uh, where's that money going to come from and uh, how how do we best spend it um matt some some thoughts for yourself on that in fun terms of funding yeah certainly and I, I i think i made some points when i was speaking around uh, around bsip which I, I think if 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 that had kind of shaped up to um to to the level of ambition that every authority uh, in partnership with their operators uh put in i think that the funding that that could have come through would would have been truly transformative right. um I, I think there there are obviously things that we can do in in the bus system to uh, uh, around efficiency which uh, kind of the, the converse of of that situation that graham described around that kind of cycle the potential cycle of of decline to uh, to improve efficiency to uh, to, 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 I guess, reduce cost of, of, of the system without uh, without current services to uh, to generate more, more revenue because the system is more attractive. But I think fundamentally, some choices need to be made, and people need to kind of decide what uh, what 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 their priority is. And it may be public transport, it may be buses, it may be something else. But but quite clearly, decisions will uh, and some of those decisions politically. Uh, will, will need to be uh, will need to be made. Uh, areas will need to understand what their potential funding streams are, and those could be things like uh, road user charging for, for us in the Liverpool city region, the uh, Mersey tunnel tolls. Um, for areas with mayoral command authorities, are, are, are presets, but th those things are, are all options that that will require some political decision making. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, some thoughts from yourself, Andy? Yeah, well, I, I mapped out some suggestions. And I've been trying to get the DFP to um, get more clarity on any future funding. But I mean, we, we have very little input. They suddenly they get there's a bit of funding comes out. We've no idea how they allocate it. There's no real transparency in it. So I've sort of set out in my presentation some of the ways I think that should be done. I think they should there should be clarity really the, the approach to the cities is different to the shires you know i mean i know there's some blurring all right but but really a completely different approach to the two um funding as i said should be focused on on investment by the where the private sector is investing if the private sector is investing in electric buses um, there should be complementary investment coming through from dft for the infrastructure to go with that rather than giving out money um, some untransparent VSIP process or based on some pop population rather than even usage, it's based on population. Um, so uh, yeah, I do think that needs to be addressed. In terms of trying to get a local source of funding, um, we did our BSIP process in conjunction with going through a consultation process to introduce workplace parking levy. And, um, and so the actual um, basic process fed in to the consultation process of workplace parking levy, to introduce workplace parking levy. And what we found is the legislation around workplace parking levy is such that um, in Nottingham are the only ones that have got it in, 
Um, we've tried to get it in. Uh, we failed. We couldn't get it within a, a four year mayoral term. It just takes so long, particularly because we've got to get the into a state where the Secretary of State has to sign it off. Um, and if we hadn't got that, we might have been able to get it through before the cost of living crisis came up. So um, we have a difficulty with that because, you know, we, we, we got, um, we've got no local streams and that does make it also difficult to bid because bidding, you normally need a local stream as well. So uh, we think there needs to be a lot more going into the, um, the funding side of things focused on on delivery not not focused on some random uh, factors which don't seem to be um, connected to whether there's going to be any successful outputs my view thanks andy and uh, your initial thoughts on funding graham yeah thanks neil um Nationally, I think I'd say there's there's three issues. There's there's size, there's certainty, and there's clarity. So so in terms of B SIPs, uh, we at CPT added up the uh, the bids across all of the the B SIPs, and they came to about ten billion pounds. I think uh, it's quite hard to track how much of that has actually been funded. I think it's about one point two billion through B SIPs directly. Although, of course, the city regions also have access to capital funding through the city region sustainable transport settlements. But clearly, it's nowhere near the whole of the ambition that local authorities and local bus operators set out. And, 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 and in a sense, that's, that's OK that government can't afford to buy all of that off in one go. But that takes me to my second point, which is certainty for the future. If not now, then, then when? How much can we expect to be to, to see invested in bus networks over, say, a, a five-year cycle? Um, and clarity is also really, really important. Uh, I, I felt the BSIP bidding process was was very opaque, uh, and clearly, from Andy's comments, uh, it, it wasn't just me. It was someone who was an actively engaged practitioner in the process who, who didn't know how to succeed. Uh, and that didn't know why he didn't succeed in the end. That, that, that doesn't strike me as acceptable. Just a, a, a comment on local sources of funding. Uh, I think the, the, the fifth key that I flagged in my presentation is all about complementary measures which could raise some revenue from people driving their cars to reinvest in, in public transport. Uh, and, and I think there's a really interesting example in Cambridge at the moment of an authority who's trying to, to, to do just that. Uh, they're investing some kickstart funding into improving their bus network. They're then, as I understand it, going to be introducing a citywide congestion charge. The revenue from that will be used to sustain lower fares and higher frequencies on the, the bus network in the, the longer term. Uh, although, of course, it's one of those things which is currently uh, facing some quite severe local political difficulties, I think, and is a really good example of the need to, to keep going and, and to be brave politically in making those sort of decisions. Thanks, Graham. Um, that's, uh, that, that's really useful, and I think all of those answers help to set the scene. Um, the, 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 for the challenges that we that we all face ahead, uh, quite a lot of the questions have been um, around um, the the one of the burning issues at the moment, which is the move towards franchising. We've got TFGM sort of uh, trailblazing that now, um, in um, in something that we probably might not have imagined if we'd uh, rewound five or six years. Um, so. Um, I just wanted to start, and, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stick with yourself initially for this, Graham. What, what do you think the right balance going forward is going to be between the, the public sector and the private sector? Um, acknowledging, I think, that probably there's going to be greater public sector uh, engagement in the, in the bus sector than has, has been the case in the past. Yeah, no, I mean, we have uh, changed, I think, as an industry over the last few years, and we have become much better at engaging with our partners at local government level um, because we've had to that's that's the way that we have 
adapted during the crisis that was the, the pandemic. Uh, and I think we will see that bear fruit uh, in enhanced partnerships uh, across the country. Uh, and, and operators and authorities are working hard to um, make those a success. Whether enhanced partnerships or franchising are the right way to improve the bus market and improve our offer to passengers in the long term, I, I think really is a, is a second order question. So anybody who is considering evaluating the, the options, who, who is considering, you know, should I, should I do a franchising assessment to sit alongside a potential enhanced partnership? I, I would always say to them first, well, what are you doing about simplifying bus fares? What are you doing about investing in bus priority? What are you doing about investing in frequency? Uh, and, and, if, and, and if they need to go down a franchise route as opposed to an enhanced partnership route to deliver on that, uh, and if that's what local people want, bearing in mind the risks, then that, that's absolutely fine. We'll work within that environment just as we'll work within an enhanced partnership environment. That's great. Thanks very much, Graham. Um, clearly, Andy, you've been, um, you, you were championing the, the enhanced partnership um, route. Um, do, do, you, do, do you see the, the ability of the private sector to, to work with you um, in, in, in the public sector to achieve your, your public sector goals? We have we have so far. I mean, it, it's difficult when you're working with a number of operators or with sort of different approaches. So it's quite a juggling, um, and it's quite a. I guess it's quite a skill to keep it all going. Whereas um, the simplicity of a franchise and a contract is clearer and easier for everybody to understand. So um, I do think there's a big learning curve on how how you develop up the EPs and how you, but you do need regular outputs. You do need, um, you need to keep on delivering things over a period to get particularly the local users and politicians to keep them engaged and having, you know, some sort of stake in the game, really. And I, I think that's the trick and it, it, it is hard work to keep it all going. And, um, you know, there's no getting around it. You do need a continual stream of delivering of projects to deliver, and they're not quick. So coming back to Graham's earlier comment about, um, you know, timeliness of funding and certainty of funding, at the moment, you know, our, our funding finishes next summer uh, with the last electric buses going in. There's no funding left at all. Uh, we're not even doing... Um, developing in the outline cases because we've got no funding and no idea where to start looking at that so it, it really um, I, I really think that if we're not careful in Leicester uh, once things start sort of there's no activity and inevitably fares go up every year in, to match cost increases um, you know the, the, the sort of franchising option will come back up again so um, it, it is all down to certainty of funding and delivering, uh, deliver, delivering something. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think Leicester, like a lot of the, the urban unitaries and some of the, the, the XPTE areas, they are, you know, they have got structures that can deliver. So, and, and the, the combined authorities, they do have uh, a you know, more certainty on funding, particularly core funding streams, whereas the urban unitaries don't. Thanks for that, Andy. And um, just thinking in terms of the, uh, the the sort of franchising context and that balance between public and, and private sector uh, engagement, Matt. Um, one of the questions that we that that what was posed was about how we make sure that we retain the innovation that the private sector. Uh, can bring um, if we move to a to to a different model. Have you have you is that something you've given some thought to in in Merseyside? Yeah, very much so. I, I think our, our our stance on on this is is pretty uh, is pretty open. Operators bring a, a huge amount of strength to uh, to to the bus network and and the bus system, and it would feel strange to design something that designs out that innovation and and that operational excellence that 
uh, that the operators uh, bring and and quite clearly and I, I, I said it in, in 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 my remarks the proper partnership working with the private sector whether that be operators in on service delivery or or infrastructure providers will will be critical to uh, to the success of, uh, of 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 these types of net, networks whether it whether it's through partnership through a formal partnership or whether it's uh, whether it's through franchising that that partnership approach it will will be really uh, will be really critical and the public sector isn't going to solve all of those problems on its own thanks matt yes um so yeah a lot to uh, a lot a lot to pick apart there and uh, it'll be interesting to watch for example how the uh, how the tfgm um experience of franchising starts to to pan out with with tranche one going live um, fairly soon now. Um, Graham in his presentation um, set out some sort of uh, what he called the five keys to success. Um, and I, I guess um, one of the challenges that we that we all have is um, how we attract non-users into the uh, into the, the public transport market. Um, Andy, I just wondered whether you'd got any any thoughts from your own uh, experience about how we go about um, tackling that that particular issue how do we get more people on buses by attracting people who who don't use them at the moment yeah i mean i think first of all we need to make sure we're keeping the ones we've got <laughs> all right i mean i i know people don't tend to talk about that very much and everyone gets too fi very fixated about modal shift from from bus uh, from car to bus all right but i i actually think that um it, you know the, the key challenge is to keep those who we've got particularly i um, mean leicester there's still a lot of people who can buy a car uh, given that our car ownership is still down that's still very you know, low um so what we try to do um, with our plan is the set of measures to try and at least retain them in terms of um, attracting others our main tool to be fair to our main tool as part of our local transport plan um, was going to be workplace parking levy as one of the key things um, because not only was that going to be a, um, a form of carrot uh, um, to attract funding to improve the alternative offer sustainable transport but it was also meant to be trying to um, a, some form of a stick uh, to try and get people across um, so that that was our main our main tool so now we have you know we do have a problem on that um, we we have put Park our own parking fed up significantly as we try to move the park the parking that the council controls so that it's very cheap at park and ride sites, expensive on street and within city council car parks. Our issue is that NCP run two very cheap large car parks in city centre and we've got no control over that. So that's quite a difficulty on that. Um, but but that said, um, as I said in my presentation, 90% of employment is actually outside the city centre. And, and so that's why the focus was, was going to be on workplace parking levy and, and you know, a, a, a cost of around about 350 a year to park your car, which we were hoping would move. And looking at the, um, the evidence from Nottingham, that would have had some impact, both in terms of the, the stick element, investment of, of improved alternative offer. Thanks Andy. Um, Graham, your, your, your thoughts in a, perhaps a little bit more detail about how we attract non-users? Yeah, th thank you Neil. I mean, I think as I, I, I sort of tried to say in my presentation, there, there, there's four sets of carrots and, and, and a bit of a stick and, and, and hopefully the, the bit of a stick can help pay for the carrots as well. I, I think the other thing that's, well actually two other things that that's important in, in applying all of that is, is firstly, um, tell people what you're doing, tell, tell them about it. Um, I, I, I met the one of the local transport managers where I live uh, the other week. Uh, and I said to him, you know, I, I work in the bus industry. What, what's, what's happening in this local area? I, I, I sort of know what's in the BC, but I'm not seeing it as a resident. And, and I feel that I should be. So it was really good to hear Andy talk about the the five aspirations and how I think he said they're on every bus stop. 
so that you're you're not you're not just doing these things to to make services better you're telling passengers and potential passengers about them really important the the other thing that i'd flag is i think it's really really important to um make the offer of improved bus services feel really really close to people's daily experience rather than something that's that's abstract and potentially somebody else so so a good example uh which, which i think andy touched on it was certainly in his slides is uh paying for commuter bus travel uh there there are several operators now who've set up um uh, commuter clubs where where they offer discounts on tickets for people buying through their employers it would be really really good i think if we could convince the government to make those sort of schemes eligible for salary sacrifice so that you get a uh, i can never remember the maths but it's either a 20 or 25 percent discount um through tax relief uh, and, and and i think that sort of initiative which you know clearly only reaches one market but it's an important market the commuting market can be really really tailored to people so that they see and feel that it's about them and, and, it, and it's a much easier offer to uh respond to and and react to and and you know do what i think is the right thing in, in reaction to thanks graham and uh matt your, your own thoughts on how we attract non-users yeah i think graham and andy both make some some really good points i will repeat them i think that what, what I would suggest is uh, really understanding non-bus users. I think we, we quite often default to the, what does the National Passenger Satisfaction Survey say? And I think there were some comments in the Q&A about, uh, well, what about non-users? So some proper market segmentation, really understanding those uh, those non-users and what it's going to take to uh to, to meet their needs and meet their aspirations and make sure that decisions that are being made within the bus system are, are helping to, to do that. And also agree with what Graham said on the combination of, of carrots and sticks. So in in doing that, uh, obviously uh, carrots, but the, the stick will be an important uh, an important tactic and strategy that, uh, that, that people need to use. In Liverpool, for example, it's very, very easy to drive into Liverpool city centre. That needs to be much more difficult uh, and but transport needs to meet the needs of those people for who you might make it more difficult. That's great. Thanks very much for everyone's thoughts on that. Um, we've um, been very focused, I think, probably on, on urban areas as part of the discussion so far. And I just wanted to widen the debate out a little bit. Uh, what are the, uh, Graham, what, are, what, what do you think the challenges are for taking your five keys to success and applying those in, in in a more rural context where clearly it's it's much it's, it's all going to be much more challenging isn't it yeah uh I, I think neil it's it's hugely difficult we've seen a massive decline in rural services uh, and unlike in in urban areas where where the decline in mileage tends to mean lower frequency in rural areas it means loss of link altogether so, 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 what do we do do with that? How, how do we put it right in in a situation where there aren't sufficient passengers to cover the cost of services, uh, and local authorities don't have sufficient revenue available to to pay for those services as supported services? Um, that, as as I think I alluded to in my comments, is the topic that CPT is going to be researching in the the latter half of this year. We want to really understand from people who live in areas which have been affected by bus service reductions what what would work for them uh, and we want to do that drawing on some experience of what's happening in in other places and what has happened in in, in other times so that you know that that might be looking at the role of demand responsive transport which you know many people think it is the panacea but but probably isn't it will also mean looking at things like uh, what's currently happening in Ireland under the Connecting Ireland programme, where they're, they're investing in, I'm sure it's more complex than this, but I think the headline is a guarantee of three buses a day for, for every rural community, so that you can go somewhere in the morning, you can get back in the evening, and there's one in the middle if you don't want to spend all day there. So we really want to test and, and understand 
which approach works for people in those communities and then to identify the policy solutions that, that need to be put in place to deliver it. It will inevitably come back to, to funding to, to some extent because you know densities in rural areas are, are such that they're very unlikely to support commercial networks. But, but I think there's much more that we can be done and we look forward to sharing the results of that. Uh, I think it'll probably be around November, December this year when that research is finished. Uh, thanks, Graham. Uh, Matt, your own your own thoughts about rural transport? I'm, I'm probably not the best person. I, a, I thought you might say that. <laughs> to, to kind of answer on, on the solutions. Um, I, I live in a rural area. If I'm going to catch the bus, it's a four mile walk for me for, uh, for two buses a day. So I very much understand uh, the frustrations and the challenges that a, a, a system like that uh, brings to, uh, to to a local community. I, I think it's, it's probably a, a very different solution from a uh, for, from those options being talked about in, in terms of a, in terms of a city high frequency uh, bus network. Clearly, uh, clearly, public subsidy is uh, is an important part of, of that. But similarly, the role of communities and, and communities kind of pulling together and deciding what what they need uh, for to to kind of meet their uh, connectivity activity needs it will, will be uh, will be important uh, i think that's, that's probably all i can add neil i'm afraid on that thanks thanks matt and uh, some thoughts from yourself andy on rural buses yeah i mean i i mean the approach is obviously you know completely different to the urban area i and i think um the bit that one of the bits that gets sort of um people don't really talk about on the rural stuff is, is school transport and um, I do think there needs to be some way of, of getting the buses that are used on school transport to um, uh, so that so that they're actually sort of clean <laughs> and nice to use because a lot of those people will will probably move in to uh, when they move through life they will probably end up in a town <laughs> and um, and be put off by using buses for life having gone on some horrible belching bus. Um, cold bus um, for their school times. But in terms of um, um, some options moving forward, I, 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 I'm still attracted to a parking aside DRT, which, which as Graham said, the sort of jury's out on whether any of that, any of all those exper many experiments are ever gonna work at all. There has to be a far greater role for community transport, voluntary car schemes. On, on this area and I think there still has to be a role for the total transport concept to try and merge across the health sector, social services sector um, with local bus sector and, ta and, and even taxis to get so that you, you collate um, all the movements into one sort of brokerage scheme and try and uh, maximise the efficiency of, of movements. On that, I do really think that is the only way forward. Uh, that that's easier said than done, um, but I, I do think that's probably um, the, 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 uh, where most of the effort needs to be looked at. Thanks, Andy. Um, the next one of the next themes that's been emerging from the from the questions that were uh, that been posed today and, and and were sent in advance is is very much the. This big discrepancies that there are around the uh, around the country in terms of levels of, of service and levels of delivery. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with yourself, Andy, if I could. Do you think it should be a statutory requirement for local authorities to fund socially necessary services? And should there be a sort of minimum level of service that we're all entitled to? I think this day and age with, with data sets as refined as they are and the ability to analyze data that's so easy now I, I do think you know we should be able to get to a stage where we have a minimum accessibility standard um, perhaps based on refined so that it's based on um, other factors such as sort of car ownership and income and other factors as that, but you, you should we should be able to get up to get a, an accessibility standard, and then um, 
and then work out what the cost of, of meeting that is. And then, I mean, I, I would admit that just having that standard and, and keep on funding something that then isn't used, I think is, is stupid. So that, that has to be based on also based on um, some level of subsidy, uh, minimum, uh, maximum level of subsidy. So, because you could end up with a, uh, an accessibility standard in a, um, that's, that's everybody accepts, but in, a, in an area with very high car ownership and it's never used, all right, you, you are wasting money. You, you maybe have that as a, as a net uh, um, a bus service there as a sort of a safety net for people. But that seems an expensive way of providing it. So I do think it has to be matched with, you know, use it or lose it. So it has to be, um, you know, based on usage as well. Thanks, Andy. Uh, your own thoughts on that, Matt, um, about a sort of minimum standard that should apply across the across the country? Yeah, I mean, from a from my perspective, I, I wouldn't wouldn't object to that. I think there's. Uh, I talked when uh, in, in my uh, remarks about the challenge of net zero and if we're serious about that being a problem and we're serious about having a set of solutions then offering an alternative to people's uh, private car it will will be important to that and making that uh, a statutory uh, requirement will be an obvious next step I, I think what I would say is that that needs to come with with funding so if there's a statutory obligation to provide services as local authorities have many of those types of statutory obligations then they need to be able to afford to to do it and to uh, and, and to do it properly so i, I think my, my point would be more around the funding to make that happen rather than whether or not it was a, a thing that happened thanks for that and uh, any thoughts from yourself graham about applying yeah. sort of minimum standards across the across the country yeah in, in in short neil i think the answer is yes uh and, and i think as andy has said it it should be tailored uh and it, it should be tailored to the particular requirements of different communities because if you've got a community where everybody's got a car and isn't going to use a bus service even if you put it on then you should probably think quite hard before you fund bus services in preference to a different community where car ownership is much lower. But, but fundamentally, I think, yes, minimum standards, statutory requirement and funded to uh, deliver against it. Yeah. OK, thanks, everybody. Um, we've been talking a lot about buses because that's been the topic of the of the conversation. Um, but clearly, buses are just part of the uh, of the wider multimodal landscape. And in particular, as we you know, as we try and encourage people to use cars less, we need to think about that uh, it joined up. And I, I guess one of the classic examples, Matt, is, is in your own area in, in, in Merseyside. Um, what more can we do to integrate buses and uh, with in particular with the rail network? Yeah, so I, I think for us, one of the one of the reasons why we we have been looking so seriously around bus franchising is that prize of being able to integrate the two systems. We're we're, we're fortunate, as I mentioned, that we have a, a devolved uh, rail network. So whilst that's under uh, whilst that's under a, 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 operated under a contract, um, we. It, it, it's still the responsibility of, of the combined authority and the ability to design a, a bus network that's complement, highly complementary uh, to that rail network and then to build uh, a ticketing system that covers uh, covers all of that that network to, to, to provide a, a, a true kind of integrated choice uh, for, for people is a uh, is a real prize. I'm aware not everyone will be able to do that. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly at the moment, and others are making steps to towards that uh, that devolution of uh, of a rail network. But uh, we're 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 really clear in terms of the ambition that we have to to create that that type of of system. Therefore, just doing bus franchising or just doing rail devolution probably isn't going to get the, you the results that, that that you want doing both of those together with with fares and ticketing may get you there thanks uh, andy i just wonder if uh, if you've got a some thoughts in the context of somebody who of a, an authority which which probably won't have that sort of devolution of, of rail 
responsibilities? How, how do you get bus and rail working better together? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I've always been slightly sceptical about uh, the focus of this uh, for places the size of Nottingham and Leicester and stuff. I, I, I you know, I, I, I don't think there should be so much priority in work given and thought process given to this because particularly now where the ticketing side of things is pretty easy really um and when people go well there's no integrated ticket between bus and rail really what they mean is they want a discount of the on the two legs it's not that they can't make the service it's but it's easy it's pretty easy to sort of buy a ticket on a bus now and it's easy to buy a ticket remotely on train now very easy so that that side of things i think is is over egged um obviously a lot of railway stations in cities are in the wrong place because the cities have developed in areas so that so it does make it difficult quite often to get all buses serving bus station uh, railway stations because they're, they're not in the heart of city centers um so that, that is a challenge um what i found a challenge in in leicester um because we have no powers over rail is just the simple things of um, getting information systems uh, and even leaflet racks and maps within the train station showing you where to interconnect um, you know for your follow-on journey by bus when you arrive um, in Leicester so that's been a challenge looking at um, the plus bus figures I mean, plus bus has been around for a long time that's still pretty low in Leicester you know so you do wonder whether there is a massive latent market here that we haven't tapped <laughs> really um that said um when we put the free bus service on recently the hop service um uh, that connects all parts of the city center to the railway station and, and the two bus stations in, in leicester um the, th the, th the second most popular stop is the railway station so um so that you know so so that you know that, that, that does show that that's um uh, getting that integration is um, is useful, um, but I'm not I'm not sure about the other way about loads of people going by bus to the railway station and out and out of Leicester. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, from the perspective of the of, of private sector bus operators, um, Graham, how do we get better integration? How do we join join things up better? So I, I'm. I'm not sure how big a problem there is, Neil, and I'm not sure how widespread it is either. I mean, on, on timetabling, uh, I hear I hear three sort of different experiences. Um, so, so Matt and others in the city regions will talk about in, insufficient join up between local rail, local bus, and in some cases, local light rail services as well. Uh, and I think that is probably true in in many city regions uh others will tell me it's a really sort of second order issue and and there's there's no there's no need to to work on it uh, others will tell me that the the integration is really good and, and in fact in um commuter towns like reading guildford are ones that spring to mind the success of the bus service is very much predicated on its connectivity to the to the rail service, and and, and that's what what makes those bus services fly. So I, I think there I don't think there is a national problem with integration. I think there are some local problems, uh, and and I you know I know that where you hear those examples of the last bus leaving five minutes before the last train arrives operators will work within partnerships to, to fix those where they possibly can. Um, on ticketing, uh, I think it's much more important that we get bus ticketing right first. Uh, and that sort of joined up ticketing across different bus operators in a local area is, is the real priority. I think when we get that right, building on the, the success of the scheme that's being piloted in Leicester at the moment, we can absolutely look to, to build that out onto to rail, indeed onto light rail and, and or integrate with the, with the modes they have. So I, in, integration is not top of my worry list or my members worry list, but we do recognize that in some places for some journey purposes, it's really important. And, and that's why uh, Liverpool and other city regions want to take action on it. 
Thanks, Graham. Uh, we're into the, the last five minutes now. Um, the, the overall theme for, for the webinars that we've been uh, involved with has been um, preparing for the for the next round of local transport plans, which are particularly relevant in, in England. And I, I, as the last question for, for each of the panellists today, I just wanted to explore um, what more we could be doing to join up uh, what we need in terms of making buses a success, which you know, we've been talking about now for the last uh, hour or more, um, and those wider transport policies and indeed non-transport policies, land use policies. Graham, some, some thoughts for yourself? Um, so I think this is really important. Uh, I think getting the local transport plan right is key to getting the bus service improvement plan right. Uh, and, and I think every local transport plan ought to have at its heart, uh, uh, and, and probably does have its, its heart, I don't know, I've not read many of them, uh, a, a hierarchy of travel options uh, where, where everything the local authority does promotes active travel first, promotes public transport second, uh, and, and car travel is, is down at the bottom. I, I'd also be interested in, in the views of Matt and Andy, actually, on what more bus operators can do to, to support that process, um, because I sometimes think that there's a risk that we stand on the outside and, and shout, more bus, please, more bus priority, uh, and perhaps don't give uh, our local authority partners enough uh, information, guidance, input, wh whatever it might be to support that process. So if, if I could ask a question as well, Neil. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Yeah. Well, and Andy, would you like to, uh, would you like to pick that up? I think that's quite an interesting uh, question to move on to. Just on that, um, we, we've got, I think, good input from particularly first bus in Leicester because they're more urban based than Arriva. Uh, and and central to rock to a certain extent they uh, they do you know uh, they are very open with the data and they do work very well on a detailed level to develop up bus priority um, and they are very realistic as well they accept that certain things are very difficult to do and others aren't so there is a good relationship at, at a at a local level for that type of aspect um they, as I said in the presentation, they are very difficult to get in. Um, and I've yet to see a bus priority scheme put in just by itself. Um, all the ones that we've put in have been part of a multi, uh, I mean, you, you, you have to, you have to multidisciplinary um, review of an area because there's so many other conflicting uses. There's people want bike lanes, people want parking, people want, you know, loads of you know large foot footways they want pavement cafes and stuff so there's they there has to be done as a multi uh, discipline so they do take a long time and they are very difficult to get in place um, and, and it does come back to uh, the politics of it of it and it is trying to make sure that um, when you're looking at a bus lane in an area, it just doesn't get looked at in isolation. And the problem when you get to the consultation stage is that if you're not careful, people just, they just see it with no context at all. So part of my role in Leicester has been trying to say, no, you know, this, this, is, this bus lane is part of a bigger process. This is the process. So as well as a bus lane, you also to get electric buses, improvements in frequency obviously reliability but also other improvements and this is the grand plan this is where we're aiming for and it all links into your wider local transport plan so and that is difficult to get across in a very detailed local consultation process but that is the trick it is the trick and getting back to um trying to get um buses sort of uh, promoted uh, out with non-bus users, which again, you know, comes back to when you're consulting about taking road space uh, from from car users and shopkeepers and stuff. You you need to do that. You we we need to be on the front foot in terms of visually creating something that looks great. You know, and the shop window is the obvious thing to do it. The shop window being the buses have got to look great from the outside. Bus stations and bus stops have got to look great from that's the, that's the shop window that needs improving. So um, I think I think 
all that yeah. is hard work. Just um, on the, the other thing to do with the local transport plan, um, we're going through our LTP process at the moment, and um, it is, um, you know, we're, we're not, we've got the normal hierarchy, we're not expecting much change in terms of our, our current policies, but what people do, do tend to forget is that we don't have control over a lot of things. <laughs> You know, we don't have control over what the private sector are wanting to do in terms of development, particularly in our case, the health trust, you know, we, so we do need to have um, and, and, the, and the universities and some colleges, you do need to work on those um, engagement links with the key employers and, um, you know, that's got to be done at a, a term at all levels right away through, yeah. through the authority in order to to make sure that we don't end up with just car based expansion um, in key areas and same goes for you know the developments outside and yeah. the, the issues that Leicester have got is the underbounding side of underbounded side of things is that most of the developments are happening on the edge of the city um, we're not involved in the conversation yeah. because it's done with the district councils yeah, yeah. Having said that, I don't want to say any more, but there is a lot of a lot of fixation about trying to improve bus services to these new estates on the edge of urban areas. All right, about and there's a lot of noise with section 106 work and huge amounts of work with you know planning work. And I I'm sort of of the opinion that do we should we really be prioritizing a lot of our work on those people who quite often they're, they're young families, young people who have moved to housing estates in the middle of nowhere that, for the reason that in the, they're on the, uh, the, the road network, all right, the major core road network, and their movements are car already fixed as car-based. They're not focused into the city centre. So why we, and I know in an ideal world, it'd be great to get them all, all linked into the bus network and get them across. But I'm just thinking, surely our plus priority is in the core, our, our main priority should be in the core urban area and try to improve those and keep them. Thanks, Andy. A final thought, Matt, before we, we wrap up? Yeah, thanks. Just on the on the joining up of, of policy point, I, I think for certainly for our city region, probably for many, it's increasingly about placemaking and the role of transport in, in placemaking. So that kind of, the, the attractiveness of the place, the usefulness of the place, how people get around the, the, the place and that being pleasant, that not being full of, uh, full of emissions and the transport's role in, in that kind of policy making uh, areas uh, uh, really uh, critical. Um, I, I disagree with Andy's point respectfully on uh, new housing estates uh, and uh, I, I think if we're accepting of, of, of that type of development just being the preserve of, of the car, then I think we're, we're, we're not going to be in a, in a great place as, as we, we, we look to uh, look to the future. Uh, although you did say in the ideal world, Andy, so deep down, I think you, you're, you're in that, uh, you're in that space. And then, then finally, just, just to address uh, Graham's point around how operators could, could help. I think sometimes we, we struggle to, tell the story about the problems that are out there on the network in terms of punctuality and and, and reliability and I, I guess where operators could really help is helping us to tell that story using using hard data and hard facts but to do that in a in a non-technical way that's gonna uh, that's gonna um, I guess pull the pull the right levers with uh, people who ultimately uh, take those decisions thanks Matt Thanks, Matt. Uh, yep, Graham. Final comment from yourself. Yeah, Neil. I, I just wanted uh, to to thank the audience. Actually, that I've seen some really good and engaging Q and A chat questions coming in. Uh, I, I just wanted to say, if anyone's got any questions for me specifically, please send them to me, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them offline. And also, if anyone's got any suggestions for bus centre of excellence activities send them to me as well and, and you know absolutely in my role on the advisory board i can kind of suggest them and, and champion them 
Thanks very much, Graham, and uh, thank you very much to the other two panellists as well. Um, it's been really, really interesting. We've overrun very slightly, but um, I think um, we, we've all got something out of that. Uh, apologies, there were a huge number of questions uh, that we just didn't really get to, but I think we managed to capture most of the themes that uh, that were being brought up, but probably just echo the same comment that, that Graham made there. If anybody wants to, to, to continue that, that debate with any of us, I'm sure uh, we'd all be more than uh, more than happy to continue to, uh, to, to discuss all of these really interesting things. So uh, thank you very much to the panelists and thank you very much to each and every one of you who's who's joined us. Um, and I hope you're looking forward to some some nice sandwiches or something for your lunch now.